Speaker will be introduced by Dr. Eric Anderson, Vice, Vice President of Audubon, and co-chair of programs. So I'll turn it over to Eric. Here he is. Thank you, Kent. And I'd like to add my thanks to you as uh, outgoing president as well. Thank I'm you. Your organization well done. So thanks. thanks. Um, if you'd walked through the forests of Wisconsin a decade before the Civil War started, that would have been about 1850. You would have passed through forest land that was made up primarily of hemlock, sugar maple, yellow birch, and white pine. Those are the four main species that covered the landscape at that particular time. Starting then, and in the next 50 years that followed, we radically changed the whole look of the forests in Wisconsin. And now, if you were to walk through that same area of the state, you'd end up finding aspen as the number one most abundant tree species in the state. And followed then by sugar maple, oaks, uh, in that mix as well. <coughs> Radical and sudden change in the landscape as we tried to feed this need that we had for timber. That was a short period of time to see a world of change, this period of time known as the cutover. Tonight, we're going to hear about another period of time that we are just embarking upon that will bring as radical or perhaps even more radical changes to the landscape and to the forests of Wisconsin. So tonight, um, Matt Dahlman, our, our speaker, who comes to us from uh, the Nature Conservancy, he's the deputy director of the uh, Nature Conservancy in Wisconsin. He happens to be an alumni of UWSP, and as he looks out in the audience here, he sees all these former professors, and I don't know, there's something that happens in the pit of your stomach when you look out there. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so nonetheless, I think Matt's dealing with it very, very well. <laughs> He's got over 20 years of working on conservation projects um, with them. He got his master's degree from Central Michigan University once, once he had finished up here with his uh, bachelor's degree in wildlife. And he oversees the Conservancy's statewide conservation activities, as well as these projects that focus on trying to create resilient forests. And I think you may discuss resiliency a little bit in your presentation as far as forestry goes. So he's been involved with uh, projects that have protected more than uh, 110,000 acres of natural areas and all the way up through working forests. So he's been integral in getting people integrated with the landscape like that. So would you please join me and extend a warm welcome to Matt Dalton. I'm going to check to see if this is actually working. Uh, does it make a difference, or do I need to move it up, or? We can, uh, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's on standby mode, that's oh. why. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we can fix that quite easily. Okay, oh, this is back in here. So now I don't have to shout. So when Dr. Anderson started, and talking about 1850, I'm like, hey, I'm not that old. <laughs> here. But um, no, thanks for being here today, and, and everyone's busy, and you have a lot of things to do, so thanks for taking time to spend an hour uh, listening to this. Um, last uh, month or so I've been thinking about, oh my, we're, we're in probably our coldest October we've experienced ever, and now I gotta come and talk about climate change. <laughs> How's that gonna go over? So, so what, I, what I'm gonna do is, is walk through a little bit about the science of what we know about climate change, and then talk a bit about weather, the difference between weather and climate, kind of like what we're experiencing, and then, then share some examples of um, what, what changes might occur in our forest that science is predicting, and what does that mean for us in our way of life here, and then talk and wrap it up, kind of what can we do about it. So that's what I'm gonna to try to do in, in the next few minutes that I have here. But before I get started, because this is the all the Leopold um, chapter essentially, I needed to throw this picture in here, and it has nothing to do with the presentation, but one of the coolest pictures we have in our archive this is Stella in, in Alba Leopold on a property in northern Wisconsin that we ended up buying from the Rar family in 2005. Uh, it's now the Guido Rar Senior Tenderfoot Forest Reserve. And this is a picture of our appraiser 
uh, taken, and this probably was sometime in the, in the early 2000s, and it's just interesting that, I wonder if Ed Stargewalt's hand is on the same tree that Leopold's hand is on. <laughs> and and if, you look at, if you look at this little, little uh, bark here, and you look at some bark patterns over here, it's like, boy, that sure could be. But anyway, there's a little remnant of that forest left that uh, uh, Dr. Anderson was talking about, and it's about 1,000 acres here in northern Wisconsin. It's on the border of Michigan. Uh, north of Boulder Junction, and it's hard to get to, but it's never been cut. So it's that little museum living library piece that's left. And it's kind of a neat history because we have that legacy of uh, Leopold out there too. So again, nothing to do with my talk so far. So anyway, I was at a meeting a week ago called the Climate Fast Forward meeting. And it was at uh, the Monona Terrace in Madison, and one of the professors that, that spoke there got 10 minutes to talk about climate change and share everything he knew. So he, he wrapped it up pretty, pretty quickly and it was pretty interesting because he said there's three things we know about climate change. One of them is the world is warming uh, and it's warmed uh, in the last uh, century about 1.7 degrees. The other thing is carbon dioxide is increasing and it's us. So, so we, can, we can say that, well, you know, it's a natural occurrence, but but really what we're seeing is that this is really us. And then he went on to talk about where I'm going to end the presentation on it related to what we can do about it. But there's a couple slides I want to share that just kind of drive home the us part of it. So this is a kind of a complex, complicated slide. There's a lot of stuff going on here. But it dates back to the about 400,000 years ago. And there, scientists are able to take uh, air or CO2 out of ice bubbles in the Antarctic. And they're able to map it back to, to how much concentration of parts per million of atmospheric carbon dioxide was around at those times. And when they map it out, they see this really interesting pattern between um, CO2. Oops. How did that happen? They see this interesting pattern between uh, CO2, which is the, the yellowish orange, and then the temperatures. So as you see, CO2 drop, temperatures drop. CO2 rise, temperatures rise. Just what we would probably predict. Greenhouse gas, we need it. it it's, it's, it's natural occurrence. It's happened before. If we didn't have the greenhouse gas effect, we probably wouldn't be here because we'd be uh, ice ball. So it's something that really uh, is, is important for life on Earth. The interesting thing is, if you look at this little circle, we're in new territory. I just looked up yesterday the, the number of parts per million. It was just over 410. So if you look at these lines of uh, under 300 essentially as much as we could ever map back in time, and now we're in essentially new territory. What does this mean? And, and that's what scientists, is trying to, scientists are trying to do, is take a look at what do we know from the past? We might have to throw all that stuff out and use predictive modeling to figure out what it is in the future. And I'll talk a little bit about what we think we know. And, and again, I, I emphasize the think because it may change. Anyway, just to, just, just to, to say that Climate change is natural, it's happened, um, but until now, it's, it's in, we're in new territory. So now this is a slide I got from an advisor of ours, uh, one of our board members on the Nature Conservancy, and I'll try to walk through it, but it's essentially trying to map out um, if, if we, you know, there's people out there saying climate change always occurred, it's because of solar flares, or it's because of the orbit around the sun, it's because of other things. So scientists have got taken those theories, and they've tested them and said, okay, if it was just, um, here's what we see. We see this, this line is our observed line. If this is temperature going up and down, cooler down here, warmer up here, and this is 1880 and this is 2014, this is what we have observed in temperature rise. So if we said, okay, what if it's just natural occurrences? So we map that out. We say, okay, let's map out uh, orbital changes in solar and volcanic. And what, is, what would that look like if we put that in a line? Well, what we're thinking about all natural factors together gives us this picture. We end up over here. We're thinking, well, we're over here. This is what we're observing. If we think about all these things that we could be experiencing, it only brings us there. So what else is going on? So then you look at, what about people? And you start putting in land use, and you look at the pollutants we put into the air, and you look at the greenhouse gases, and you map those and model them out. Look where that goes. It kind of tracks pretty well. So if you look at all human factors across, um, all human factors across the timeline, we start getting to a model that predicts where we are right now. 
So when we think about, you know, people can, can say, well, I don't believe in climate, si or, or, uh, climate change. It's not people, it's natural. All that we have to go on is the science that we have. We look at the past, we predict the future, and what, we're think what we see is it is us. And, and there's really no denying it. So, so what do we do about it? I mean, we, it's, it's, uh, it's something that's happening. We know it. And, and what does it mean for us? So, again, uh, if it wasn't for October, I probably wouldn't be talking about the difference between climate and weather. But I wanted to just kind of establish that we have um, science telling us that it's us. And, and we're the ones that are adding the greenhouse gas effect. And the other thing is people always say, well, it's just natural weather, weather patterns. And, you know, it could be. So let's look at, at uh, weather. I pulled this from the uh, weather data uh, station just for, I think it was a couple days ago. And this is just looking at the difference between weather and, and climate is about time, essentially. So weather is what we're experiencing, what we experienced last week. But climate is about what we experienced a decade ago or a, or a century ago. And when you look at this, oops, keep on pushing the wrong button here. If you look at this, this top line is the last uh, 30 years, I think, from uh, uh, 71 to 2000. So there's 30 years of data here. That's our average kind of yearly from January to December, uh, what our <coughs> average temp on the highs are. The blues are the lows. And this is our last year, 2019 in here. So you look at 19, we had a pretty cold spring, winter last year. Uh, it shows that October was below uh, our average. But that's just, that's essentially weather. It, it just fluctuates back and forth. If you start looking at over a longer time period, this is Wisconsin weather, um, or temperatures I should say, in February. From 1880 or 1895, I think it is somewhere here, till 2017. So you look at that, we got big variables. We had cold times, we had warm times, even back in the, in the 30s, dust bowl years, and it fluctuated back and forth. But then when you start putting trend lines on it, and you start looking at what this means, it means that in February, over the last century, or since 1885, 1895, we warmed 5 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in our February winters. So 5 degrees, it's hard to feel that, but when you look at it over time, this is kind of undeniable that, that we're warming. So you know, it, that, that's the difference between the weather that we, we feel, and it's cold, climate change must be over, but really you've got to look at it long term to actually get a, get a sense of what's going on. Here I pulled from, from uh, uh, October, also just to kind of look at what's going on. Here we sit in North America. You look at the, the reds are the warm colors across the globe. The blues are the, uh, the cooler colors. Uh, Wisconsin sits over here. North America was kind of cool in October. And so was a little bit of Europe and, and places in Antarctica. But when you look at all of the temperature probes across the entire globe, we, again, by a narrow margin, recorded the warmest October in this data set from 81 to 2010. So we are freezing, but the globe is still warmer than, than it ever has been in that, in that time period. So again, it's, it, the data exists. You can't just take one point and say, climate change is over because I live in Colorado and we're freezing. Uh, you gotta look at it in context of everything else. Here's another slide that I, I'm borrowing from our, our uh, uh, board member from, who was a professor in meteorology in Madison. And it just goes from 1880s, cools are blues, yellows and reds are, are, uh, are warmer. You look at this, 1920s, you get to the 1950s, you start seeing a little bit more. 1960s, it cools. And then in the 70s, watch what happens in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, <laughs> through the 2000s. So, in the last 30 to 40 years, we've seen a dramatic amount of warming going on, and that's kind of where we're at. So, again, you know, uh, things are warming. Uh, we kind of uh, the science is telling us that. Uh, so, what does this mean for what does it mean for us in Wisconsin? So, let's talk about what those those changes mean for. Especially, I spend a lot of time. So, so a little background on me. I, I work for the Nature Conservancy. I started in our project in in Ashland, Wisconsin in, I think, uh, 95, and it was about looking at a watershed and how we protect the watershed. The conservancy at the time was just like a land trust. We were buying land, and what we realized, it wasn't about uh, buying land to protect a, a watershed or a wetland. It was about land use across the whole area. What do we do? So we bought some land at the headwaters of the Bad River, and we started managing timber on it. And, and because the biggest land use in that whole watershed was forest management, 
we were a conservation group with nature and conserve in it. What did we know about timber? We had no credibility in talking about forest management. So we went in and, and got a thousand acres from Georgia Pacific. We started managing timber so we could then practice what we preach. And what we learned is that we started looking at 1850, that forest that Dr. Anderson was talking about. We wanted to recreate it after the big cutover. And then somewhere in the mid, you know, 2005, somewhere in there, climate change came around. I'm like, now what do we do? We can't look back to the 1800s. We need to look forward. We, gotta, we can't, we can't um, expect to create the forest that was here 150 years ago. We need to look at 100 years from now and see what's going to be resilient. So that's what we are doing on our properties. And I'll talk a little bit more about that adaptation project uh, later on. But what science is telling us is that overall, we're going to be wetter. I think we've seen that this year especially. And, and overall, we're going to be warmer. But I'll talk a little bit about what that warmer means, because we did not have a warmer summer. And, and overall, we haven't been experiencing really hot 90s or 100 degree temperatures. So where's the warmer coming? Here's um, information from this Dan Byma, professor at UW-Madison. He's the person who talked just uh, last week at this climate flash, fast forward. So I borrowed some slides from him. So this is observed temperature change. This is in comparison from uh, 1950s to 2018. And what we're looking across northern Wisconsin is kind of in the winter months, essentially I don't know, somewhere five to six degree more warmer. So we are warmer in the winters by, by five, four, five, six degrees. So that's hard to feel, really. You know, if it's, if it's 20 below or if it's 15 below, what's the difference? You can't really feel it. But it's a difference when you start thinking about natural processes, the plants and animals and their dependence on frozen periods and insect and their viability. If you look at the summer, we're not warming that much in the summer. Maybe one or two degrees in the summer that we, we uh, have observed. If we look at precipitation, this is again 2018. Uh, winter months, we're looking at about 20, 15 to 20 percent wetter. Summer months, uh, we are in the south, and this is again 2018. I think you put 19 on here. We are definitely turning these things into a, a aqua blue color, I think, uh, because we were really wet in the north this last year. Uh, but somewhere around, you know, overall, the southern part of the state was a little wetter. Uh, I think this trend, as we look at longer, more data, it'll show that the whole state is getting a little bit wetter. But it's not evenly dispersed across, but that's, that's what we're currently observing. So what, is this, what does this mean? Warmer temperatures, more uh, rain? Essentially what it means is that we have more energy in our system. So if you have warmer air, it can, it can hold more water. If we have more water and, and warmer air, you have more energy, and you can have things, even though we are talking about climate change and warming, we may have events like this. Just think of Lake Superior. A blanket of ice on top of Lake Superior, we don't have much lake effect, snow effect, or lake effect snow. Once we have a little bit warmer and we don't have that lake freezing, we got, we'll still have cold periods. And when we get that wind blowing across the lake that's open now, we get events that look like this. And this is probably taken in Buffalo somewhere. Or it could be early, I'm not sure. Uh, th this was definitely northern Wisconsin uh, in a couple of our events that we had. A uh, Father's Day event in 2018, 2016. Okay. Highway 2. Yeah, Highway 2 got uh, blown out. But these, these are happening more frequently. I mean, I remember talking to my dad, who was 89, and, and, uh, and my grandparents, and they said, we just don't get the all-day soakers anymore. We just get it in buckets. Well, it sure seems to be, and when you think about what their observations are, here's what we're actually seeing. So our three upper Great Lakes states, uh, events of, of three-inch rainfalls or more, look at Minnesota, 71% more events since 1960s. In Wisconsin, we're looking at 92% more of these three-inch rainfall events than we had just a few decades ago. So what does that mean? I mean, that, that has ramifications, especially if you're a city uh, wastewater treatment person, thinking about how do you handle that much water in a short amount of time. So talking about adaptation, we need to think about not only natural adaptation uh, things, but also how do we use green infrastructure and how do we how do we develop and build differently? How do we right size culverts so we don't have rain events blowing our, our, our roads out? How do we spend more money now so that we don't have to spend it later? And David Mladenoff was a uh, forest or is a forest ecologist from Madison. And he was on our board for a while, and we had a board meeting, we were talking about climate change, and David said, look, we as humans are not hardwired to handle climate change. We, we like to react to emergencies. 
we have a, a, a fire, we can go put it out. We have a tornado, we bring in a lot of people to help out. When we have something that's looming 50 or 75 or 100 years down the road, we have a real hard time figuring out what we do. So I think you know, the more we can take a look at this data, share it with people, get, get more of an understanding out there, the more hopefully that we as, as people can think about how do we adapt and how do we, how do we um, you know, change the way that we live to, to address this issue. So I spent a lot of time thinking about forestry just because we, I, I always worked in the north, 17 million acres of forest, and, and that's a big part of, of the natural system in Wisconsin. So I spent a lot of time in working, I, I should have recognized that earlier, but the, the slide that I had, the, the title slide, had the Forest Service and a, a group called Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. A lot of the slides that I have and a lot of the science that comes from, that I report on, comes from those two organizations, especially NIACS. And, and um, so the next slides that I have are really about uh, pulling from scientists because I'm not creating this stuff, I'm just using it. And, and uh, Stephen Handler from NIACS is the person that's really the expert in the Midwest about what's happening here. Uh, and, uh, and I have a couple other resources I want to share at the end too about where you can learn more about this. So what do we, what do we expect? And, and every time uh, people uh, ask this, it's like, well, I want certainty. I want to know exactly what's going to go on so we can address it. That's again, that human behavior part of it. We, we, need, we want to react to something that we know. Right now, it's, it's, we have to accept uncertainty. We're, if you go back to that bar graph where you see the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, we're in new territory. We, we've never, there hasn't been humans alive uh, that have dealt with uh, 410 parts per million. Just new territory for us. So whatever I say in the next following slides, in five years will probably be wrong. But, but, but at least it'll be, it'll be giving us a predictive uh, idea of what direction to go so we can start making small incremental changes now to hopefully address some of this. Some of the stuff that's happening with climate change, we're not gonna be able to adapt to. That, that Father's Day flood, you cannot adapt to a 10 inch or 12 inch rainfall in eight or 12 hours. Can't do it, no matter what we do. Uh, so we're just gonna have to figure out how do, we, how do we avoid places like that that we know are gonna get flooded periodically. Okay, so what do we think is gonna happen by 2100 in our forests? So 40 to 80% decrease in snow. 30 to 50 days free, uh, uh, fewer frozen ground days. Earlier snow melt, more freezing rain, more freeze thaw uh, cycles. Uh, 30 to 70 days longer growing season. So that's the crystal ball. Um, we're not sure it's right. More than likely the trajectory that we're on with pulling out of Paris Climate Agreement and avoiding any real good constructive conversation and policy behind climate change, probably gonna be worse than this. And, and maybe some of this stuff isn't all that bad. Uh, but, but if I were investing in Granite Peak, I probably wouldn't do it after 2050. I'd probably want to sell that business. Um, I, I think of, of things, we, a few years ago we were reading always in the paper about what was happening with Lake Erie and, and the elbow booms that are there. If you look at that watershed, Lake Erie is primarily urban or, or agriculture, mostly agriculture. So it's the amount of, of nutrients coming off the landscape. Lake Superior is in really good condition and it's, it's, there's no, there's no uh, denying the reason why it's in good condition is because 98% of that watershed is forested. And, and if we have a month long growing, uh, longer growing seasons, what's the, the chance of having corn and beans in the Lake Superior watershed? So we, we, need to, we can think about this now, again, trying to be a little bit more predictive and think about land use changes, where people are going to live, what are people in Arizona going to be doing in 2050? I don't know, Lake Superior looks pretty attractive. And the beaches that are there look a lot like Florida. It's just cold, but if it's but if it's a lot warmer, you never know what it might look like. So so we have some of these crystal ball estimates out there. Now it's up to us in the next generation before or after us to figure out how do we make sure that we keep the values that we want in the landscape. So go into a little bit more detail on this. I'll touch a little bit more on every one of these parts about what does it mean for longer growing seasons to increase stressors. So. Right now, we've seen the last 40 years about six to eight days uh, earlier in things like bud, budding and earlier growing seasons or last frost days. Uh, we've actually seen hardiness zone maps change. This really uh, uh, cold zone is gone from Wisconsin now. 
And, and I think there might even be an updated uh, hardiness zone map uh, from 2012. So you look at, at things like if we, we're living over here, if you're thinking about planting or putting in new shrubs or planting trees in your yard, you might want to think about what is good to grow down here because it won't be long before this tension zone that we are right on in, in this area is going to be in a different uh, growing um, hardiness zone. So it's, it's kind of neat. You know, you look at these and people say, well, climate change isn't occurring. But then you just look at something as simple as this, and why is this changing? Well, something's different, and something's changing, and this is about where we can grow plants where we couldn't grow them before, and that's about climate change. So a longer growing season, obviously there's some benefit to it. We can grow more basal area in our tree per, per, the, per growing season, or we can have corn growing in places where we didn't have before. Uh, so that's, there's, there's some benefit to that. In a forested system, you know, what we're seeing though, we're still going to get those cold snaps. So what was it, 2012 or so, we had 80s in March. Things started blooming out in places like Door County where the cherries and the apples grow. We had a terrible year because everything started blooming and then it froze. So the idea that, that climate change is just going to make things warmer, it just means that it's just going to get weirder. And, and, and that things like this might happen more often. Um, we're getting warmer and wider, but, but we can still have drought stress, especially on tree species in places that are, might be a little better drained. And the reason being is that these rainfall events that are creating more water overall are happening in such a, a, a short amount of time that we can get increased runoff. So that's issues with it's not infiltrating in the ground, it's not available for the trees to be there, they still go about their business doing what they need, but this water is coming down running off and not available for the trees to uptake. So some species on marginal soils like sugar maple on, on marginal sandy soils may not do well because they don't have the access to moisture because it's gone. It's going through the system really quick. So we got to think about where you live, the species that you might have there, how that might, how these impacts might have changed it before you start thinking about what to do long term. Um, wind events, we had one here uh, not too long ago this summer, so in July. One of the most, hard, uh, most difficult things to predict from a science modeling perspective but what we're seeing is, again, more energy, more, more heat, more uh, moisture in that system, more energy. We're seeing more extreme events. Uh, I was just at a Governor's Council on Forestry meeting. We got an update from the Forest Service. In this wind, in this wind event that, that happened in Wisconsin, it blew down uh, 286,000 acres of timber. And that's the equivalent amount of, if you add up the industry, states, the feds, all together in one year, that's about a much uh, land that gets treated. So in one wind event, a Friday and a Saturday morning, it knocked down as much wood as we can handle in one whole year. So we know that, that it's going to be hard to pick this up and salvage it. And, and what's the ramification of uh, wind events like this happening, or big storm events? It could be an increased fire. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but anyway, it's just something we need to take. There's not much we can do about it. We just got to think about how do we respond to it. A um, couple other things that we're seeing. Um, is that it's predicted to be warmer in the winter. So this, this idea of, of getting warmer doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna have 100 degree days. What it means is that we're gonna have less cold. And what we're seeing, and science is showing right now that we're observing is uh, less cold at, in the winter. So those 40 below temperatures that we saw or our, our uh, generation before us saw, uh, we may not see that uh, other than on real rare occasions. Uh, so prediction is, is about eight to 15 degrees warmer in the winter. What we're also seeing is that the summer, as I mentioned, isn't like getting a lot hotter during the days, but at night, we're seeing that it's not cooling off like it used to. So when it used to get into the 40s or 50s at night, we're still staying with high dew points and getting into the 60s and 70s. So that's changing, uh, and we're seeing that already. From a, from a timber perspective, so the Nature Conservancy isn't, we, we promote forest management where it's, where it's appropriate. We think that, that having a healthy industry is a good thing so that we can maintain uh, large blocks of land and uses for, for forest management. Otherwise, if we didn't have this economic generator, there wouldn't be an, a, a, any kind of driver to keep big blocks of land intact for wildlife uh, function and everything else. So we're, we're concerned about this trend where, you know, historically a lot of, uh, probably two-thirds of loggers' business happen in the winter months. And what we're seeing now is a, a less duration of time that we have frozen soils. So there's some stands that you might not even get to, cedars and, and swamp conifers, kind of swamp hardwoods, that aren't frozen enough to even manage in, in most cases. And we're seeing that across the state. From north to south, we're seeing less amount of, of frozen conditions 
than we have over the last uh, several decades. Uh, I was talking a little bit about fire as it relates to the wind throw. Uh, we may see more fire because you have more dried, dead uh, timber on the ground. But maybe not. This is where there's, there's some uncertainty, and it's, it's because we live all over the place now. Fire suppression is a big thing. Smokey the Bear was probably the most successful campaign ever, uh, even to the demise of systems that need fire. Uh, but in places that, that we need to put them out, uh, fire, it, it may not spread. And we do still have that, what we call the asbestos forest, that northern hardwood uh, maple system that is hard to burn. So we still have a component of it. So fire may not be a big driver in the future. But it could come with these wind events that we see in certain areas. So credit to David Mladenov from UW-Madison, former uh, uh, trustee of ours. Uh, this is a predictive model looking at what, where vegetation might go. So this is current on this side. Uh, the greens are oak, hickory, uh, and this is what we see right now. Oak, hickory, the, the goldish yellow is the maple forest. Uh, this kind of lighter um, um, greenish is kind of ash, uh, cottonwood. And then the, uh, the, the purplish color in here is just kind of, again, this is a large scale, so it's hard to map out because there's aspen that exists all over these purple color. So if you look at low emission scenarios, and this is this comparing if we were to do today, pretty much stop the amount of CO2 and, and greenhouse gas emissions going out, we would be in this lower emissions because we already have uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, it's gonna stay there for a while. The reality is we're on this higher emission trajectory. So if we are, are optimistic, we see a big increase in the amount of oak, hickory forest, maples are doing okay, aspens pretty much leaves the state, even under low emission scenario. Under the high emission scenario, we lose our maple. We have oak spread all over the state. Ash and cottonwood is, is uh, growing better. And again, what this is about is about suitable habitat. Are the conditions, it doesn't mean that it, the trees will die and, and be gone. What it means is that when you have a tree, it might not replace itself because it won't find suitable conditions for it to grow. So what these predictive models are saying is if we continue on this path, we're looking at, at if, you're, if you're a forest manager, you might want to think about transitioning from um, maple, birch, basswood, to oak, potentially, if you have that opportunity. So I'll come back to that in a little bit, talking about our adaptation work at a, a property that the Conservancy owns. But anyway, this is, this is, um, this is an interesting, again, crystal ball to, to see how vegetation might change around the landscape. Uh, we in the central part of the state might not really see that big of a change. We're, we're fortunate to be at this tension zones, so we're kind of at the north end of southern and south end of northern, and, and there's always been a mix here anyway. It's at these extreme ends that we might see big changes more so than even over here. So let's take a little closer look at this. This is sugar maple, suitable habitat currently. The blues are where they really like it, and the greens are where they prefer it. You look at low emission scenario, about a 15% reduction in suitability, a high emission scenario, 65. Look at another common one, quaking aspen or, or trembling aspen. Uh, here's where they're really happy, northern Minnesota, Wisconsin. You look at low emission, high emission, 78% reduction. So you're a deer hunter, a grouse hunter, you're, you're a county forester managing lands that have mostly aspen. By 2100, we're predicting 80% decrease in suitable habitat. So when you're managing aspen after aspen after aspen rotation, you might need to think about how do you diversify that stand? Planting trees, where do you get those trees from? Maybe look south. Those are the type of adaptation things that we need to be promoting now because forests change over generational time frames. So we can't just say, the next time I enter, we're gonna convert it to hardwoods because that's not gonna work. So anyway, we have science that's helping us. Not all of it's depressing. And, and I just realized that I probably will never be invited back here because this is a really depressing <laughs> conversation. Um, I do have some birds slides, but that's not very optimistic either. So, so this is the optimistic part of it, is that white oak, we're looking at major increases in the ability of, of white oak. So if we think about um, um, opportunities, I don't know, maybe in my yard in Tomahawk, I'm gonna be planting white oak instead of have that aspen in my yard. But anyway, so that we have models for just about every tree species that's to in Wisconsin and to the south. And if you look at uh, some of this uh, work down here, the vulnerability assessment, if you just type that in, it'll probably pop up with this uh, resource. And you can look at all the tree species that are either on your property or in your yard uh, to give an indication of where these things are moving. Um, a couple other things, there's, there's stressors out there that, that uh, 
Um, like invasives that seem to be doing really well with climate change. This is knocking on our door, woolly adelgid. Hemlock is one of my favorite trees. And um, this is really limited by cold temps. So last year it got cold enough where it would have knocked them out. 30s and 40 below, they can't survive. But when we stop getting 30s and 40 below, they're able to move in. So Pennsylvania, the Virginias, uh, and into the Northeast, uh, woolly adelgid has had major impacts on hemlock. And it's a pretty decent wildlife tree. I mean, in the winter, it's a, a place where it can, can buffer uh, the amount of snow and provide thermal cover for birds and, and mammals. So that makes a big impact. Uh, just another thing I wanted to mention is that not all things that are impacting their forests are non-native. So this is a, a, a lot of stuff going on here. I'll just point out what you can't probably read in this slide is that um, there is a eastern larch beetle uh, in, in Minnesota in, in its native to Minnesota. But what they've found is that because the winters are warmer, that we're not getting the, the mortality on the, on the beetle, and that because the summers are longer, we're getting two generations per year. Mm -hmm. So when we had uh, one generation, you had, you know, if you had 100 beetles <coughs> affecting a tree, you know, that tree could live along. Now it's got 200 beetles on that tree. Mm -hmm. So just the, the idea of having two cycles, and that's what's happening for the most part in the western uh, pine beetle, a bark beetle, you're seeing this same thing with the, de the dying of, of uh, conifers out to the west. So pretty interesting that native species can be enhanced because of the other stressors that are happening with climate change. Okay, another um, uh, uh, Leopold, I had to put that in here. What, what are we also seeing? And this is Nina Leopold Bradley in a study she did in 99. Uh, so 20 years ago, she was even seeing that looking at uh, uh, 55 ecological indicators, that things on average were, were happening a day, uh, 1.2 days earlier per decade uh, during this time period. So you look at vegetation, when things are blooming, when things are arriving, uh, even 20 years ago we were seeing that. I, I would like to see this, this study re-done uh, now, and I think people are working on it, uh, but we would probably even see a more dramatic uh, uh, earlier uh, number here. So, can't talk to an Audubon group without talking about birds, but again, I, I apologize in advance. Uh, this is a study that just came out in uh, 2019. I don't know if people have seen this at all, uh, but it's kind of depressing. What, what the study had said it, or shows that North America, so U.S. and Canada, we, let, we, we declined by an estimated 3 billion <coughs> birds. So where is that coming from? And not all of it's climate change. So we can't point our finger just at, at, at climate. It can be pointed at us to some degree. If you look at grassland birds, that's probably predicted. Our, our amount of grasslands that we see across the state or the Midwest decline dramatically. We're growing food on that area. So we'd probably expect to see that kind of decline, plus issues that are happening where they winter um, are, are another issue. So we gotta look at both their breeding and, and wintering, overwintering grounds. We look at our eastern forest birds, they're doing okay. We still have lots of forest. They're declining, but but um, you know not that you know I shouldn't say not that much. Seventy percent is a lot. But what I want to point out is this impact in this boreal forest of birds, because that one might be our indicator of, of climate change, because our boreal systems are are changing probably more so than than others. We're seeing uh, boreal birds in trouble in Wisconsin. Again, I apologize for all. I couldn't pull this slide apart. People may have seen this. But what I wanted to point out from this uh, Wisconsin Breeding Bird Atlas work is the changes in species ranges. So um, evening grosbeak, this is where they were in 95, 2000 when they did the first breeding bird atlas. This is the records in 15 to 19. That's a huge difference in, in not that long of a time. If you look at, you probably can't read this, but if you look at uh, this list of birds that are declining, these are the increasing, and these are things like orioles or merlins, um, um, bald eagle, dick sissels are incre uh, increasing here, which is interesting. But uh, on the decline, you see a lot of these species like oriole chickadee, Canada jay, um, blackback woodpecker. Um, these are evening gross bait. These are typically boreal, northern type of connected species, and they're declining a lot. So, so that's that's pretty indicative of what might be occurring with with uh, our forest. So. I needed to talk about my favorite, one of my favorite birds though, and the great jay, <clears throat> and, and I'll explain this a little bit. So the, the Nicolay bird uh, survey has been going on for a long time, many decades, and Linda Parker, who works as a forest ecologist at Park Falls for the Schwamme Nicolay, uh, shared this data with me. 
And <clears throat> what it is, is, the slide's kind of confusing in a way, but what they did is they took the comparison of 91 to 2000, that decade, 2001 to 2010, and just compared point counts. So where they, they stopped and had birds, um, they saw that at six places that they stopped, they had increase. So if they had one before, they had two. Or if they had none, they had one. But at 35 points that they stopped at, in this decade versus this decade, they had less. So if they had two, they had one, or they had zero. So that is a huge change. So they said, well, is that just something in our data? They compared that to wild turkey, and it was backwards. It was almost no decrease and a terrible increase in those decades. So we had very little in, in this decade by 01 and 10, turkeys were all over the place. So, so when they tested the data, it actually is indicative that gray jays are, are declining. And I'm fortunate enough to own 80 acres in Iron County, north of Mercer. Bought that in 1999. And you couldn't sit at the picnic table without having a pair of jays visit you. They were vocal, they were always there. If you left some bread, uh, part of your bread on the table, they could come down and get it when you're sitting right there. It was awesome. Every time I was deer hunting up there, I'd hear them and, and see them flying around. You would know where people shot deer by, by, um, by, the, by the jays. But, but I know I haven't seen one since 2005, which is pretty crazy. So I think a couple years ago this came out, and it was a study that was done in Canada at Provincial, Lake Superior Provincial Park, and it was looking at gray jays and what's going on over there. And what they found is gray jays are interesting because they, they uh, lay their eggs in the winter, they hatch in the winter, essentially late winter, and they're able to do that because they're, uh, they have adapted to a lifestyle of caching. So in the, in the fall of the year, they pick up berries and they, they cache it. One, one pair can have a thousand different places that they put things, and they remember where to go back. Um, what they cache are things like berries, or they find dead animals, and they're caching um, um, you know, animal uh, fat. And, and what they have seen is that, with the exception of last October, we've seen warm Octobers and Novembers. So we get 60 or 70 degree days or 80 degree days in October. <coughs> what that happens is that it causes that cache to spoil. And when the, when the eggs hatch then in February and March, and, and they, they just have no food to feed them. So we saw a major uh, quick decline uh, in, the, in that 2001 to 2010 time period because we had warm falls uh, before. And, and maybe you know, years like this, this past one in this last October, if we could get some consecutive years, maybe that'd be good for Jays. But they're in trouble. They may be our, our true canary in the coal mine related to climate change. And, and it's, uh, it's unfortunate because we may have to go to Canada to see a Canada Jay at some point. Um, anyway. Enough of that depressing news. Uh, so what can we do? Um, anyway, so what we can do is adapt, we can mitigate, and, and we can educate ourselves and, and use that education to be good advocates of, of what we know and the science that we have. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in adaptation. Again, just a real small piece. There's a lot of stuff that we can all do. Uh, a little bit about mitigation and, and, uh, and end with some um, educating yourself and some resources to check into. This is some of the stuff that we're doing on adaptation as it relates to forest. This is a, a stand that we have at our Carolyn Lake property in Ashland County. Here's the species mix that we have in it. And again, as I mentioned before, we were really looking at sugar maple, basswood, yellow birch. That was our forest that we were going to be managing for because we were looking back to the 1800s. Climate change came around and we said, okay, let's run these species through a vulnerability assessment and figure out how vulnerable our stands are. Low emission scenario, I can still manage. 11% of our stands, aspen, and I wasn't going to manage mostly for these species anyway. Ash is going to be a, a loser because of emerald ash borer. I'm okay. The reality is we're headed in this direction. So 63% of my forest in, in Carolyn Lake is, it, is potentially vulnerable to climate change. What do I do? You know, my, my sugar maple dominates that forest, so I, I don't know where I'm going to go because every time I cut a tree, I'm going to reproduce a, a sugar maple. So what we're, what we're really looking at is that this small component of northern red oak is, is throughout our understory. So what we're doing is, is we're trying to promote. We're not cutting sugar maple like we traditionally, like remove a tree, single tree selections type of stuff. We're looking where we have chances to regenerate oak, and we're going to put in a big pocket so sunlight gets down and hopefully helps it grow. So that's, that's the kind of adaptation techniques we're trying to spread far and wide, county, state, federal, private landowners to think about how do you use models like this to make you think a little bit differently than the next entry in 10 or 15 or 20 years? Let's think about management on a 50 or 100 year cycle, and these type of uh, models can help predict that. 
what we do is with this is uh, the colors are really bad but what we would do with this is we turn these into kind of visual maps uh, what's hard to see in here is that okay this is a high emission scenario here's the trees that we're managing in the overstory here's the trees that if we cut one of these these are the ones that are going to grow so there's some places like over here where our overstory, um, <coughs> browns are bad, reds are, are a little less bad, orange is okay, um, yellow, which you don't see much of, is okay. It's probably doing well. So we want this whole forest to be yellow at some time. And so when we look at places like this where we have established regeneration being really bad, but our overstory being okay, we really got to think twice about how we manage this stand because if we remove it and we're perpetuating these, we're going to be in trouble. So where we get places like this ring around here, where our understory is better than our overstory, we can cut trees and promote those, and we're going to be okay. So this really has changed the way that we manage our timber. We don't do traditional techniques. We actually look at what's on the ground and everything in between, and then we think about uh, planting and figuring out what's missing and how do we perpetuate a forest that's out there. So again, these are the type of models we'd like to get into forestry speak in forestry tools so that people are able to click on a map and say, wow, you know, 50 or 100 years, we better think differently about how we manage this stand. And that can happen at large scales or your back wood lots. Uh, we should be looking at this. And this is about building resiliency into that stand. So how do we build something that's made up of species that, are, that science is telling us that is going to do a little bit better in the future? Okay, I'm going to wrap up in a little bit here. I just want to mention that our property is part of a uh, demonstration that spread throughout the, the Northeast. Uh, this is all about testing. We're going to fail and we're going to learn from our failures and we're going to succeed in some places. But if we don't test, we're not going to know. And that's what we're trying to do and be part of. And this is with tribes, the federal, the state, private landowners, uh, nonprofits. Uh, but there's a lot of information if people are interested uh, at this website. There's a lot of resources on, I mentioned NIACs again, a lot of resources that they've come up with adaptation that relates to forest. But adaptation can be more, you know, so it, think about are you a farmer, are you a, just a, a landowner? What can you do on your own property if you live in town to keep more water on your, uh, on your lawn? How do you amend that soil so that it soaks in instead of runs off? How much impermeable surface do you have? Those are type of adaptation techniques that you can do on your own uh, lands that you have. So let's talk a little bit about mitigation. A year ago, the Conservancy published this article, and it was about... We did a study and it took a while and it was a lot of uh, academics across the country saying what can nature do for us on the mitigation side and adaptation is about how do we how do we look at building something that's more resilient or adapted to the changes that we see coming mitigation is about how do we release or sink back the carbon that's in the atmosphere how do we keep that from uh, continuing to rise above 410 parts per million so what this study says is that our natural lands can make a big difference if we were to improve management, do um, uh, plantings where we can plant, if we could stock forests to, to have them stocked the way that sh they should be um, stocked, if we change the way that we do agriculture, plant cover crops, do no-till, keep more carbon on the soil, if we protect our grasslands and, and increase them, we could do the equivalent of taking every car and truck off the road. So that nature has an ability to, to do that. So, so it's up to all of us in this room and, and everyone else that has a piece of land to look at how that we can use the land and the species grown on it to sink carbon. So we, we are trying to promote this as much as we can. We've just, uh, Governor Evers has asked or assembled a team uh, to be part of the U.S. Climate Alliance. And that's exactly what we're trying to do is to figure out how do you incentivize, how do you educate, how do you get people that have the ability to manage their forests differently or, or sink carbon in their forests or, or on their agricultural lands and how do we, we encourage people to do that. So you'll be hearing more about the governor's efforts in this arena as we get more into this U.S. Climate Alliance work. So federal level, there are, we pulled out of Paris. There's 28 states that said we don't care what's happening at the federal level, we're still interested in this stuff. Wisconsin, when Evers came on, uh, entered into the U.S. Climate Alliance with I think 27 other states, so 28 total. So states are doing it, right, regardless. The other thing I want to mention is that just educate yourself. I think one of the things, that, and I'll, I have a slide in a minute here, about one of the most important things you can do about climate. But one of the things is, is to understand what your impact is. I, I, for years, for work, have driven an F-150. I admit it. Sorry. Apologize. And I didn't realize that every gallon I burned in that truck was 20 pounds of CO2. And, and I, I never, when I, we got that truck new, I never clicked the A trip and it calculated how many gallons of gas I've burned. 
it's 8,960 some, I just checked the parking lot here. And if you take that and, and you multiply it out, that's 85 tons of carbon I put out in that truck alone since I've driven it since 2012. I, 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 I work for a conservation group, I couldn't even believe it. <laughs> Luckily, I've been involved in timber projects to, to protect land because it, maybe that's offsetting the carbon. But that re just being educated about what that means and what your footprint is makes you think twice about what your, your act actions are. So TNC has this, um, the Nature Conservancy has this carbon footprint calculator. It's kind of cool. Gives you an idea of what your house, the way you live, and what your carbon footprint is. They give you an idea of what to switch. You know, light bulbs, start. Um, car, electric. You know, that's a start, things like that. So it gives you an idea. Uh, there's a lot of other things out here. I'd, uh, I'd like to highlight this uh, Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change. Uh, there's a lot of great information at this wiki uh, website, so if you're interested in more information, there's a ton of good uh, videos that are short, minute or two long, about everything from fly fishing to maple syruping and how climate change might impact life, to, to cross-country skiing and downhill skiing. So really good place to educate yourself on. And I end with this. Uh, there's, a, there's a lady by the name of Catherine Hayhoe, and she's a, I don't know if people have heard of her at all, but she is, she is very interesting. Um, she's got a blog, she's got like a 17 minute TED talk that I would advise anybody to listen to. Um, she's, she's a scientist from Canada, and she starts her, her talk out a little bit um, about being put into a lecture hall uh, in, I think, Austin, Texas somewhere. She gave her talk about car the carbon cycle, how that's working, and she got done and said, is there any questions? And a student stood up and said, you're a Democrat, aren't you? And she goes, well, no, I'm Canadian, but, but, uh, but, but she said, it doesn't make a difference. If you take a look at your thermometer and you're a Republican, or if you take a look at the thermometer and you're a Dem, does it read something different? And that's her point. If, if there is no difference in it. And, and I, I love this because it's like, well, all these people are upset that we're doing something that, that's probably a hoax. Who cares? If we come out with, in the end, an energy independence in itself should be something we should be shooting for. These green jobs and preserving unique places and healthier lifestyles that we have, that's, that's what we're talking about. Clean energy. That, well, who's against that? Why, why wouldn't be, we be for it? So anyway, th this is the stuff that, that I, you know, I, I have family members, I have a lot of people I talk with that are like, eh, it's just, you know, it's not occurring, why would we want to do it? My response is, why, why, what, what, hurt, what does it hurt? To, to think about it in this way. So anyway, that's what I have. And I think I took us a little long, sorry. Um, it's 8 o'clock. So, so we probably don't have time for questions, or we could take one or two, but if not, then my email is right there, I'm down at tnc.org. Uh, if you want to email me or call me, I'm happy to, to get you what what you're, if you want some slides or anything else, let me know. I can give Let's you go ahead with questions. Okay. We have plenty of time for questions. Okay. Plenty of time for questions. So, any any comments, thoughts? Am I crazy? Uh, where where is everyone? I guess. Yeah. Matt, what kind of uh, reaction is the forest industry giving? to the coming changes? Are you seeing type conversions happening? Or are you seeing them predicting for the future? What, what are they doing? So everyone could hear the question. So you know, it's, it's interesting. So I've been on the Governor's Council on Forestry for quite a few years, and it's, it's, it's really <coughs> slow. Uh, we've, we've tried to get some of this climate adaptation work out to industry, and it's slow because, look, most of the paper industry is worried about what's happening next month or in, in next year, much less 20 or 50 years down the road. So their time frames are just, it, it's hard to mix climate change and time frames of economy and business, so it's difficult. Uh, where we're seeing a little bit of change is with county forests. Bayfield County is doing some testing. Uh, they've actually uh, uh, tried to diversify some of their aspen stands by planting conifers. They've even brought uh, bald cypress from southern Illinois and planted it in Bayfield County. And, and they're just testing it. What they're finding is that deer really like it. Um, but, but you never know. You know, that type of, you know, we're, we're not all out there saying we should be assisting migration of these species, but we should test these ideas and see what happens because that we're, that's where we're going. Uh, we tried to work with, uh, with Flambeau Paper Mill. You know, people have heard of what's happening with Flambeau. They're going bankrupt. And, and they were really interested because their company that supplied them all their wood was a company named Future Wood. 
So if you have a future wood as a company name, why would you be thinking about this stuff? Uh, and, and they were, but, but again, the economics didn't play out for that business, and now they're out. So it, it's, it's tough. Industry's going to have a hard time with it, but I think what we can do is start on, lead by examples on our public lands, our you know, NGO lands, um, our own private lands. We can start thinking about this, and then uh, we can bring industry along. So, yeah. What's going to be the impact of the storm this summer that blew down so many trees with people trying to get logging done over the next few years? I mean, or is that stuff unsalvageable because it's all like pickup sticks? Or? Yeah. So, what's the impact of the, the 286,000 acres that blew down this summer? Um, I know personally that I have a bid on a timber sale and I couldn't, I didn't, it went up on bid. So I, I sent it out to 15 loggers. They put it on the Great Lakes Timber Professionals website. Never got a bid on it. And the reason is because even even like on state lands and state sales, they've given their loggers the permission to pack up and move over to where the the salvage is. So I think for the next uh, um, you know this winter at least, where they can still salvage, salvage some of the stuff that's there, it's going to be tough for us private landowners to get a logger. Um, eventually, it'll get to a point where they can't salvage anymore. Uh, there was some discussion about bringing in a biochar uh, unit, which is a unit that takes wood and essentially does an incomplete combustion on it, so it, it kind of smothers it out before you actually um, totally burn the wood, and you just get charred. You can use that as soil amendments, and they couldn't get the uh, air quality permits to, to bring that in. So I think a lot of that wood is going to probably go bad. Uh, I think the public lands are going to be picked up, but the private lands are going to suffer. So, and then we hope that there will be opportunities maybe to come in with state programs like a program called Wiffle Gap. It's like the uh, Wisconsin Forest Landowners um, Incentive Program where you could apply for grants to, to plant trees and do things like that. So, yeah. I'm very glad that you mentioned Catherine Hayhoe's TED Talk. Yeah. and encouraged us to see it because I've seen it and it's outstanding. Yeah, it is. So I don't want you to forget that as an important part of your talk as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And I've heard her speak two or three times in person in Washington, D.C. when I'm lobbying on Capitol Hill on climate change issues with Citizens Climate Lobby for the last eight years. And she is a dynamic speaker. She, she just brings down the house. She's smart, she's articulate, she's funny, she's just all the kinds of things you'd want to have in a speaker. So if you ever have a chance to hear her speak, she'd be good. Yeah. But one of the things I want to bring up was uh, carbon fee and dividend is now in place in Canada as of January 1st this year. Now, uh, British Columbia has had it since 2008, but now all of Canada has some type of carbon fee and dividend program. And we're working hard in the United States with Citizens Climate Lobby, which has a display right back here. Uh, to do the same in the United States. And uh, people say, well, Trump will never sign it. Well, uh, Trump will not be in office forever. He, sooner or later, there will be someone, whoever that might be. Right. And uh, we can't just give up, throw up our hands and say it's useless. That's not the right approach. It's, uh, there is hope. We've got a bill in the House right now that has 70 co-sponsors. It's called H.R. 763. And uh, we're gaining uh, a lot of uh, forward success. So um, the way that they had people with co-sponsors is you have to have one from each side of the aisle. Mm -hmm. So if there's 70 co-sponsors, 35s are down and 35 are Republicans. Yeah, that's a great bill and, and hopefully it passes. I, I, one of the things that we can do is, again, educate ourselves and talk to our representatives. Because a lot of times there's a disconnect between what they're promoting and what we believe. So. Be that voice. Get out there and talk to them. So that, that's really important. Thanks for saying HR, that. HR 763? Yes. Is that what it is? Okay. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Um, with the big wind this, you know, this uh, in July, we lost, oh, 25 or 30 trees on our lot. And we have the whole west side of our lot had all the pines taken out because they were all bent and old. And you, I was interested in your discussion about the types of trees that should be planted for the soil type. How would one go about finding out what's the best thing to put back into that side of the lawn? Yeah. 
I, the, the, if you could, if, if you have access to the computer and look up vulnerability assessments, mm -hmm. there's ones for for uh, southern Wisconsin and northern Wisconsin, and they give you uh, the list of all the tree species that are growing there and which ones are projected to with two different uh, forest models, mm -hmm. um, tree atlas and landis, and they they give you an estimate of which ones might increase and decrease. And again, this isn't about trees being gone and being vacant. It's about May, they may not find suitable habitat to grow and reproduce underneath themselves. So if you plant a maple in your yard, more than likely it might be there for a long time, um, but, but it probably won't be coming back. So I would say that if you're talking about your ornamentals in your yard, you don't have to worry about it that much. If you're talking about reforesting a forest that, that you want to serve as a function for the birds and the wildlife and the water and everything else, you may really want to think about uh, those models in a different way. So, so I, you know, University of Wisconsin Extension is a great resource on a lot of this stuff. Um, Chris Piles, I don't know if she, I think she works out of our uh, of Extension's um, uh, WASA office, but she's a really good resource, and she's she's on our uh, Wiki uh, Forestry Working Group, so she'd be a really good resource if you want to ask that question. Okay, thank you. So, yeah. Are there some tree species that do a better job at sequestering carbon? Yeah. So. You you cut wood with an axe or a chainsaw. Yeah. The ones that you go through really easy aren't as good as the ones that are hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so if you look at like oak or maple, those are a lot better. There's more more um, essentially more carbon per per volume in those systems. So I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's something like um, if it's like half of the weight of a of a of an oak tree is carbon and maybe uh, uh, only a third of the weight of a white pine is carbon. Mm -hmm. So it's just more, more porous in the, in the wood. Yeah. And, and anybody who's a forester here might be able to answer that uh, you know, better. But essentially, are denser, harder trees, hickory, oaks, things yeah. like that. Thanks. Yes. Well, uh, I think Matt will stick around for a few minutes. If you have any questions, you can come up front and ask them. But at this point, I'd like to thank Matt for coming and joining us. Yeah.